An hour later, we were ready to leave. Gabe took a breath from his poker game long enough to watch me lug my mom's bags to the car. He kept griping and groaning about losing her cooking, and more importantly, his 78 Camaro, for the whole weekend. Not a scratch on that car, brain boy, he warned me as I loaded the last bag. Not one little scratch. Like I'd be the one driving. I was 12, but that didn't matter to Gabe. If a seagull so much as pooped on his paint job, he'd find a way to blame me. Watching him lumber back toward the apartment building, I got so mad I did something I can't explain. As Gabe reached the doorway, I made the hand gesture I'd seen Grover make on the bus, a sort of warding off evil gesture, a clawed hand over my heart, then a shoving movement toward Gabe. The screen door slammed shut so hard it whacked him in the butt and sent him flying up the staircase as if he'd been short shot from a cannon. Maybe it was just the wind or some freak accident with the hinges, but I didn't stay long enough to find out. I got into the Camaro and told my mom to step on it. Our rental cabin was on the south shore, way out of the, at the tip of Long Island. It was a little pastel box with a faded curtains, half sunken into the dunes, there was always sand in the sheets and spiders in the cabinets, and most of the time the sea was too cold to swim in. I love this place. We'd been going there since I was a baby. My mom had been going even longer. She never exactly said, but I knew why this beach was so special to her. It was the place where she'd met my dad. As we got closer to Montauk, she seemed to grow younger. Years of worry and work disappearing from her face. Her eyes turned the color of the sea. We got there at sunset, opened all the cabin windows, and went through out usual oh, sorry, and went through our usual cleaning routine. We walked on the beach, fed blue corn chips to the seagulls, and munched on blue jelly beans blue saltwater taffy, and all the other free samples my mom had brought from the work. I guess I should explain the blue food. See, Gabe had once told my mom there was no such thing, that they, they had this fight which seemed like a really small thing at the time. But ever since then, my mom went out of her way to eat blue. She baked blue birthday cakes, she mixed blueberry smoothies, she bought blue corn tortilla chips and bought, brought home blue candy from the shop. This, along with keeping her maiden name Jackson, rather than calling herself Mrs. Ugliano, was proof that she wasn't totally suckered by Gabe. She did have a rebellious streak, like me. When it got dark, we made a fire. We roasted hot dogs and marshmallows. Mom told me stories about when she was a kid, back before her parents died on the plane crash. She told me about the books she wanted to write someday when she had enough money to quit the candy shop. Eventually, I got up the nerve to ask about what was always on my mind whenever we came to Montauk, my father. Mom's eyes went all misty. I figured she would tell me the same thing she always did, but I never got tired of hearing them. He was kind, Percy, she said, tall, handsome, and powerful, but gentle, too. You have his black hair, you know, and his green eyes. Mom fished a blue jelly bean out of her candy bag. I wish he could, have, could see you, Percy. He would be so proud. I wonder how she could say that. What was so great about me, a dyslexic, hyperintensive boy with a D-plus report card kicked out of schools for the sixth time in the sixth year? How old was I? I asked. I mean, when he left. She watched the flames. He was only with me for one summer, Percy, right here at this beach, this cabin. But he knew me as a baby. No, honey. He knew I was expecting a baby, but he never saw you. He had to leave before you were born. I tried to square that with the fact that I seemed to remember 
something about my father. A warm glow, a smile. I had always assumed he knew me as a baby. My mom had never said it outright, but still, it felt like it must be true. Now, to be told that he'd never been, never had even seen me? I felt angry at my father. Maybe it was stupid, but I resented him for going on to that sea, that ocean voyage, for not having the guts to marry my mom. He left us, and now we were stuck with smelly gape. Are you going to send me away again? I asked her. To another boarding school? She pulled a marshmallow from the fire. I don't know, honey. Her voice was heavy. I think, I think we'll have to do something. Because you don't want me around? I regretted it, the words, as soon as they were out. My mom's eyes welled with tears. She took my hand, squeezed it tight. Oh, Percy, no. I, I have to, honey, for our own good. I, I have to send you away. Her words reminded me of what Mr. Brunner had said that it was best for me to leave Yancey. Because I'm not normal, I said. You say that as if it's a bad thing, Percy, but you don't realize how important you are. I thought Yancey Academy would be far enough away. I thought you'd finally be safe. Safe from what? She met my eyes, and a flood of memories came back to me. All the weird, scary things that had ever happened to me, some of which I tried to forget. During third grade, a man in a black trench coat had stalked me on the playground. When the teachers threatened to call the police, he went away growling. But no one believed me when I told them that under his broad-brimmed hat, the man only had one eye, right in the middle of his head. Before that, a really early memory... <clears throat> I was in preschool and a teacher accidentally put me down for a nap in a cot that a snake had slithered into. My mom screamed when she came to pick me up and found me playing with a limp, scaly rope. I'd somehow managed to strangle to death with my meaty toddler hands. In every single school, something creepy had happened, something unsafe, and I was forced me to move. I knew I should tell my mom about the old ladies at the fruit stand and Mrs. Dawes at the art museum, about my weird hallucination that I had sliced my math teacher into dust with my sword, but I couldn't make myself tell her. I had a strange feeling this news would end our trip to Montauk, and I didn't want that. I tried to keep, I've tried to keep you as close to me as I could, my mom said. They told me that was a mistake, but... There's only one other option, Percy. The place your father wanted to send you. And I just, I just can't stand to do it. My father wanted me to go to a special school. Not a school, she said softly. A summer camp. My head was spinning. Why would my dad, who hadn't even stayed around long enough to see me be born, talk to my mom about a summer camp? And... If it was so important, why hadn't he ever mentioned? Why hasn't she ever mentioned it before? I'm sorry, Percy," she said, seeing the look in my eyes. "But I can't talk about it. I, I couldn't send you to that place. It might mean something, saying goodbye to you for good, for good. But if it's only a summer camp," she turned toward the fire, and I knew from her expression that. If I asked her any more questions, she would start to cry.